Today on City Line, a look at how integration has shaped Boston, including the impact the city's infamous busing history has on today's students. Karen Holmes Ward, welcome to City Line. Boston has struggled to outlive a reputation as a city plagued by intolerance and prejudice. But today, any visitor or resident can see that the racial landscape of Boston is vastly different than it was decades ago when the busing crisis put Boston in the media spotlight. Later, we're going to discuss how Boston has been integrated through education and economics. But first up, we all know the neighborhood of Jamaica Plain for its cohesive, local, homegrown feel. But is integration bringing a few unexpected changes, like economic inequality? Jamaica Plain, or JP as it's affectionately called, is known for its diversity. While JP residents are ready and willing to accept integration, are they ready for the higher prices and big business that come with that change? Richard Thal, the executive director of the Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Development Corporation, believes that while JP has always been a place of tolerance, there's been a noticeable economic shift in the neighborhood. There's always been um, a big variety of people in JP, which has, I think, given a lot of the flavor and excitement to the community. But definitely, we've been seeing trends the last 10 years that as more and more folks come in with, with lots of money, that we are facing a lot of the same issues in this community that, that we're seeing across the country with kind of a growing trend of inequality in the community. And the minority residents of JP have had front row access. But one of the things that that data showed is that income of the white households in the neighborhood over a 10 year period did go up. And the income of African American and Latino households actually went down. And so if you looked at every dollar that a Latino family earned 10 years earlier, at that point, the average white family earned a dollar and 90 cents more. So it was almost twice as much. But 10 years later, for every dollar that a Latino household earned, the average white household earned three dollars and 10 cents. So this idea that somehow we weren't going to be affected by some of these larger trends of, and growing inequality, that was completely wrong. J.P. Gazette editor John Roosh echoes the sentiment about the decline in income. What's really interesting to me uh, looking at census data is that, like everywhere else in America, we are seeing uh, a disappearing or declining middle class in Jamaica Plain. Uh, you know, it's a stratification of incomes. Um, and I think that's a real concern. Gentrification is a phenomenon that has drastic effects on the landscape of a community. But Roosh believes that the direction the community takes is in the hands of its people. A lot of the debate has presented it in terms of the gentrification just happens, or you know the economy just changes by itself, by the invisible hand or whatever, and it's nonsense. You know These are very clear decisions we make about the types of businesses we want, the types of housing we want, and we get the kind of neighborhood we build. Uh, bottom line. And the neighborhood is attracting new residents with higher incomes and higher end businesses with proprietors like Q Beauty Salon owner Jennifer Leiden. Well I think that you can see by what we've done here that the other end of the concept is that that it should be community based but high service, high value. We were trying to go for upscale so that was exactly why we made it to look the way it did. We want to, we feel that the community is evolving and we want to evolve with it. Leiden understands that JP is a neighborhood comfortable with integration and that's why she chose the diverse neighborhood to take on an industry that is usually very segregated, hair care. I always felt that when I was always doing hair I could always do everyone's hair so I never understood if you walked into a salon people were being turned away and I thought that, that was wrong. Leiden isn't concerned about gentrification or economics so much as she worries about knowing her niche and providing JP women across the color spectrum with the hair care that they need. 
We are changing in the sense that classically, for some part of JP, if you were of any other ethnicity other than white, you would have to leave JP to get your hair done. I mean, other than like the Latin Quarter, which you know catered to their own community. So this is something new. Economics, class, and integration are all factors that JP residents are now having to acknowledge, but many are not worried as there are dedicated community representatives and residents alike who are determined to keep JP authentic. Thal predicts that with that kind of commitment, JP will still be a viable and relevant community in the future. I would like to see continued vitality in the neighborhood. I'd like to see all the different ethnic groups in the neighborhood really feel like they have a stake in the neighborhood and that they're here for the long term. And of the undeveloped, publicly owned land, I would love to see beautiful new communities there that, that are very diverse and that have a good percentage of affordable housing so that all kinds of people can afford to continue to live in this community. The effects of integration can be seen everywhere you turn. Find out how students are adjusting years after school desegregation in Boston. Welcome back. The busing experience in Boston is a memory that is still fresh in the minds of many Americans, but believe it or not, it has been nearly 40 years since the court order mandating that Boston schools integrate. So where are Boston students now? Are they receiving quality education and thriving in diverse ac academic environments? Well, to speak to that, we have Jean McGuire. She's the executive director and John Shandorf, associate director from the Metropolitan Council for Educational Opportunity. Let's welcome them to the program. For uh, people in the Boston area who, for some reason, don't know what METCO is, Jean, please tell us about the METCO program. Well, you can uh, log on and see it on a website, of course. But tell me how uh, it we got started. Are, it, it started long before Judge Garrity uh, came on the scene in Boston. It, was, it grew out of the Fair Housing Group and the League of Women Voters in Newton and Brookline and uh, five towns, Weston, Wellesley, Lincoln, who wanted not to wait for integrated schools through housing. Mm -hmm. So what they did was uh, they talked to Ruth Batson and, uh, and the um, directors of Freedom House. We had a series of meetings there about how we could help the children in Boston through a tutorial program uh, on Blue Hill Avenue through the black ministers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they decided, well, we have declining enrollment and we're closing schools, so why don't we bring some out? So a small program was developed through the Carnegie Foundation. Uh -huh. and, and for three years, we we tried it out and it worked well and then it expanded. And, uh, and it's been growing and expanding yeah, yeah. ever since then. John, uh, tell us why the Metco prob program has been so important to educating young people in the Boston area? Well, it's, it's twofold. Uh, Metco uh, enables students from the uh, city of Boston to go to school in 31 uh, suburban districts and six in metropolitan Springfield uh, and Springfield students go there and it enables them to take advantage of the high quality education that also exists out in those suburban districts. Equally important, the students who are residing in the 31 participating districts have the opportunity with our students coming there to be educated in a culturally diverse and racially diverse environment. Without METCO that wouldn't necessarily be the case in most of the participating towns. Are there studies that show that there is, in fact, a real impact on students of color and students in the mainstream community if they are educated in an integrated environment? Yes. It would depend on what you're looking for in a study. If you, if you want to look at the income earned, anyone who gets a good education anywhere tends to have a, a good chance of earning a decent salary. Mm -hmm. Say if you go to Boston Latin School or technical programs in any school system, you, you'll be in demand in the New England area. But I think that the, the most important lesson that you learn is how to get along with people and be comfortable mm -hmm. uh, and feel at ease. And that translates well into the workplace. Mm -hmm. And John, you uh, agree with that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, studies show that both for the 
the Caucasian students as well as the students of color because of the relationships that are developed, the familiarity uh, that develops in the relationships and being educated with them, that they do uh, far better uh, than students who live and go to school in uh, racially isolated uh, or racially segregated communities. And that's what the studies show. The medical program has just been extremely popular in Boston and was a great alternative to the court order, mm -hmm. uh, which as we all know just was disruptive for uh, both South Boston and Roxbury. Um, has the medical model been duplicated in other cities? Yes, it yes. has. Yes. St. Louis, uh, Berkeley, California. The oldest one is urban suburban in Rochester uh, and West Arundel and other sub suburbs around mm -hmm. Rochester. And uh, there are there have been programs in Milwaukee. Uh, there have been a number of them around the country that have either been one way or two way. Mm -hmm. Oz is one way, St. Louis is two way. And most recently, uh, Omaha has come online. That's right. So it's yeah. not uh, it's not something from the 50s, 60s, oh, no. or 70s. Uh, a number of the programs uh, were developed uh, in the 80s and uh, most recently in in the uh, 21st century. Same kinds of positive results, I'm assuming, oh, yes. in those cities yeah. uh, that we have here in yes. Boston. You, you have integrated schools in Boston, but if the suburbs, it's the housing issue. Mm -hmm. Until you integrate housing, then you won't need a program like this. Is uh, Are medical students draining the best and brightest from Boston public schools? Oh, no. Some I mean, might argue. I, I had a principal ask me, I, you know, when he was in Boston, he says, you're taking our best students. And then he got out to one of the suburban towns. He says, why do you keep sending all these special needs kids out here? I said, oh, it depends on how you look at me, huh? isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's more of uh, a myth. Kids are kids. And uh, I think all kids are special as far as I'm concerned. I don't, I don't look at kids in terms of labels. This is an integration program. However you are academically, uh, there are other things that are important in life along with it. The, the, the participants in the program, uh, like anyone else, will, will look and find opportunities where they may lie. And mm -hmm. uh, METCO only serves a small portion of uh, the students who are uh, enrolled on the waiting list. Uh, there are approximately 1,700 to 2,000 students that are signed up each year added to the waiting list, and yet we only place between 350 and 400 a year in the suburbs. The other part of the uh, reality in regards to that question is, is how many of our students come back and test into Latin and go to school Latin, where they've spent their elementary school years or middle school years in the suburban districts, but are able to pass the ISEE test and come back into Latin or to some of the other private and parochial schools in, in Boston. So you've got a lot of success, and uh, based on the number of students on the waiting list, um, mm -hmm. obviously lots of families and lots of students want to participate in the Medco program. Jean and John, thanks for joining us today to talk about what's been going on with Medco. You can learn more about Medco by logging on to our page at WCVB.com. Up next, a Boston group that's looking to shake up the establishment. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The folks at the Future Boston Alliance are the new kids on the block. They've been locked in debate with Boston leaders over the future of the city and how to prevent an exodus of the city's young talent. But that's not all they want to focus on. Ridding the city of old guard ideas and prejudicial barriers are at the forefront of their agenda. We want to turn Boston into a city that says yes more than it says no. The Future Boston Alliance is the hot new organization you may or may not have heard of. Created by Karma Loop founder Greg Selko, they first received notoriety when they released a not so flattering YouTube video of Mayor Menino and his seemingly outdated views on Boston. The regulations, out of date outlook and power structure are holding our city back from being the best it can be. The hub has long suffered from brain drain, a problem that occurs when youngsters done with their education in Boston leave the city for cooler, youth-friendly cities. The future Boston Alliance has made it their goal to stop the outpouring of young talent 
it has now given them a reputation as the organization trying to hip up Boston and bring everyone together. We have to look beyond racial diversity and look at class diversity, look at experience, um, you know, what those different puzzle pieces come together to actually make a really, really beautiful picture. Malia Lazau, a founding director of the FBA, believes stereotypes might be part of the problem. When people see movies like The, the Departed, they think that that's what Boston is. And the fact of the matter is, is that Boston is a majority minority city, which means there is no majority race. Um, and we should actually celebrate that fact. Um, we should celebrate that we have one of the largest Haitian populations, one of the largest Cape Verdean populations. Um, you know, we're, we're a great melting pot um, of, of a city and of a community. And the Future Boston Alliance really wants to elevate um, that. Her staff reflects diversity. It's not deliberate, just naturally expected. I'm black Puerto Rican Italian, so it's hard for me um, to not have diverse networks. Being in diverse communities is something that I thrive on. I think that our generation as well operates um, within mixed circles. Malia is confident that the road to full-fledged diversity in Boston can be an easy path, and the FBA has plans to be a part of that journey. For Future Boston to be successful, um, it's a matter of us not only seeing how Boston feels differently, but also how Boston looks differently. So hopefully if you go out in the theater district at night 10 years from now, you'll see a diverse group of people from all neighborhoods in Boston. And thanks to Future Boston's efforts, that goal may be just a little closer. And today we're pleased to have Malia Lazu, who we just saw in the segment here with us in the studio. She's one of the founding directors of Future Boston Alliance. Now, Malia, black, Italian, Puerto Rican girl from Hawaii in <laughs> partnership with an Irish kid from Jamaica Plain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How did that all get started? If that's not the 21st century <laughs> what for is? you, right? <laughs> what is? Um, so, you know, I was introduced to Greg Selko by his, um, the chief marketing officer for Karma Loop at the time. And um, he was a, actually a Haitian Irish mm -hmm. guy working at, at Karma Loop. Karma Loop has quite a diverse staff. And Haitian Irish? Yes. Okay. From, from Eggleston Square. Okay. <laughs> We, we've been diverse for a long time, right? At w whatever we want to say about the city of Boston. But, um, and so he introduced me to Greg Selko, and I had been starting nonprofits since I was at Emerson College and was just very excited about the potential of this project and, and what it could be. Mm -hmm. um, why has Future Boston Alliance chosen diversity as one of its main platforms? Well, we really think that um, there's a couple of reasons. First, we really think that the racism brand that Boston gets um, is not is not wholly deserving today, right? Um, it, it's it was deserving, um, and and Charles Stewart and and Bus. I mean, there were horrible healing that that you know we, we have to do some serious healing in this city but today um, we are diverse and the fact that Daryl Settles is the only black person that has a liquor license in this city um, d says something and and we believe that if some if Daryl Daryl's Corner Bar and Grill Daryl's Corner Bar only and Grill black owned restaurant also in the downtown area exactly I mean it's just it, it says something about what the culture is going to be then mm -hmm. at, at, at that point. Um, you know, when, when all you have is one um, barkeep, I'm sure Daryl wouldn't want me to call mm -hmm. him a barkeep, but you know, if you have one, then, then what does that say, you know, about, about the, even the restaurants we're putting out? So we thought it was really important to address the fact that Boston did have uh, you know, and, and I mean, show me an American city that doesn't have a race problem, but that, you know, but that we've also changed a lot and, and we should celebrate that. We talked about a, a mass exodus of brain drain and we also see uh, often an exodus of professionals of color, uh, students of color leaving the city after they graduate from college or grad school because they're, in their mind, Boston's not a welcoming city. Exactly, exactly. Now, I was lucky enough to not have that. Um, coming from Hawaii, I didn't know anybody when, when I moved here, but I met at Emerson folks who were from Boston, and actually a couple of them were from Codman Square. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's one of the reasons why I was also so open to stay in, in the city was after I graduated, I felt that I had a sense of community that was reflective of, of who I was. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, some people might suggest that the Future Boston Alliance gives the old guard a hard time, that there's a lot of poking and prodding that comes from your, your corners. Uh, true, uh, false, uh, or in, if it is true, much needed. 
You know, I think that um, every every generation has this, right? Um, I worked for Harry Belafonte, and I used to, um, you know, I used to kid around with him, like, well, Bobby socks, right? <laughs> used to be considered, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, outrageous and a stick in the eye. So, you know, I think that we're trying to create and find a space for you know this generation and young professionals in this city and and I'm sorry if that feels like a, a poke in the eye you know I mean we, we love this city um, and we are very appreciative of, of the old guard and I think time makes a passing of the baton mm -hmm. um, if, if nothing else so so you know we're, we're getting ready and we're putting out our agenda <laughs> but you know to your point if you look at the folks on the street in the neighborhoods it's very diverse but if as you move up the corporate ladder, the power structure, it's less and less diverse and you only see the same types of people running the city. That's right. I mean, and if you look at what happened, I, um, the article that the Phoenix um, sort of scooped around the um, the newsletter for, for the Boston police and, you know, and what that sort of uncovered, I mean, I, I think that it's those types of stories that have people be like, see, mm -hmm. see, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that that, you know, it's not reflective of who our city is. Now, we uh, talked for this whole program about the uh, impacts of integration. Uh, in your view, um, has integration been a positive and what are the negatives that you see? So, um, you know, I think that all, I think that diversity is a positive um, and it, it might not happen um, as smoothly as, as we would all like and we all, um, I think, re reject change um, to some extent, that's human nature. Um, but I think that when you see it, groups of people that are diverse, you see some of the best ideas coming out, right? Um, Steve Jobs wasn't an engineer, he was a calligrapher, right? It, it's in that diversity of working with Walzniak, right, who was a, an engineer, that they were able to create this, this beautiful product. And, and I think that that's really what integration and, and what equal mixing um, and of diverse peoples can can do. And I think that that's the part that we end up doing so wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it's not um, it's not enough to say, okay, we have, you know, all the colors of the rainbow and, you know, and, and all of that. It's, you, is, it, does everyone feel that their voice is heard? Are there people who might be standing next to you who still feel invisible? And I think there's a lot of people in this city who feel invisible to City Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mayor Menino does acknowledge that Boston is a majority minority city and as I said, you can look on the street and see that. Um, but uh, sometimes change is slow in other quarters. Right, right. And this is one of the few cities that is a majority minority, but you don't see us when we go out. And, you know, I, I lived in Brooklyn for a couple of years, and um, it was beautiful to just see all, you know, you would see all these different races coming together, whether it was at the Brooklyn 